got a Bible, you can follow it. And I hope you've got a Bible at home. And if you have, will you try and read uh, this epistle? 1 Corinthians starts with Paul introducing himself. He says, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank, thank God for you because of the grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into the fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers... Some from close household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptised into the name of Paul? I am thankful that I did not baptise any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptised into my name. Yes, I also baptised the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptised anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Now God will bless that reading of his word to us. We read about Paul going to Corinth in Acts chapter 18 as I've said. In the previous chapter the Apostle Paul had visited the city of Athens. He had seen some people converted in Athens. Mind you, it was a difficult place. The people of Athens, much like the people of Corinth, boasted of their knowledge and their, their understanding. And all these Greeks loved to argue about things. Now, uh, that's quite a modern trend as well, isn't it? They love to split hairs, arguing about a single word in their philosophies how their particular philosophies could be applied. Now, many of them were very clever people. Many of the great things which we believe came from ancient Greece. We have a democratic government. The whole idea of democracy, although it was only on a city-wide scale in those days, was thought up by those old Greek philosophers. Some of you uh, le learn the sort of mathematical principles that um, some of them propounded, like 
Pythagoras and Archimedes. They were real people who, um, who lived around that time. They were clever people. But they had this uh, knack of just loving to argue. And Paul confronted these great philosophers in the city of Athens. And it finished up with them just laughing at him. Mind you, not everyone laughed. Some believed. But in a very clever place, it's perhaps significant that fewer seem to believe in, in Athens than in almost any other place that Paul visited. And so Paul left Athens. I'm not quite sure why. The Acts of the Apostles isn't quite clear. But he travelled from Athens to Corinth alone. And he arrives in this great city of Corinth all alone. Corinth was a really great city. About 40 years before Jesus was born, uh, the old city of Corinth had been destroyed. It had been rebuilt, so it was a nice, new, modern city. And the architects did a better job of it than they did rebuilding Birmingham after the Blitz. It was a beautiful city. But it had quite a reputation. It was a port, and um, because it was a seaport and ships came in from all over the world, there were people there who were very wealthy. One very old writer describing the city of Corinth gave a list of all the things that he noticed on the docks as he walked through the uh, port of Corinth, and uh, I wrote it out. He, he noticed that there was Arabian balsam, Egyptian papyrus, Phoenician dates, Libyan ivory, Babylonian carpets, Sicilian goat's hair, Lyconian wool, and Pergian slaves, all waiting on the docks. Now, if you put all those places together, you'll find that the ships must have come from all over the known world. And because there was a lot of money in Corinth, there were a lot of Jews lived there the Jews controlled much of the commerce of Corinth. So although the Jews went in a majority by any means in the city of Corinth, um, they were quite important people. But not only were the Jews, there were in fact people from all over the world lived, lived in the city of Corinth. There were many different languages spoken. The official language and all the business was conducted in Latin. But it was a Greek city, so most of the people spoke Greek. But then the Jews brought their own language, and people from all over the world brought their different languages to this city of Corinth. It was a cosmopolitan place. Well, our world's like that, isn't it? Many of our cities are like that. Going to Birmingham, you'll find people from all over the world speaking lots of different languages. If you go to some places around where I work, or I have worked in Birmingham, you'll find many of the notices in shops in two or three different languages. So you see, uh, what Paul found in that city is very much like our modern world, and it was like our modern world in many other ways. Corinth had a reputation not only for being a very wealthy place, but for also for being a very corrupt place and very immoral. There was a great temple in uh, the city of Corinth. It was um, a temple built to a goddess, Aphrodite, or Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love. Maybe that's why Paul included in this epistle that great chapter about love, real love, not the thing that the Corinthians often call love. It's said that in that... Um, temple which was built on a hill, the heights of Acropolis, there were thousands of temple prostitutes. And there were other temples in that city of Corinth. Um, there was one to a goddess Isis, and several others whose names I can't pronounce. In many of those temples, the priestesses ruled everything. 
and they ruled in ways which were very often uh, very terrible and immoral. We've got to remember that when we read Paul's words about the position of women in the church, the sort of background that he was writing about against in that city of Corinth. But of course, like most of these Greek cities, and Corinth particularly, it boasted of its learning, its wisdom, the skill of its orators and of its philosophers. Can you imagine one man alone coming to a place like that, one of the largest cities of the world, and it's sometimes said that if you put um, Athens and Corinth together, you have the Oxford and Cambridge of the ancient world. And here he is alone. And he has come with a message from God. A message which will change this city. Or at least change many of the lives in this city. One man. Alone. But of course the secret is he wasn't alone. He had come with the power of God and with a message from God. How is he going to face this terribly immoral city? What was the message he was going to bring to them? That place, you know, was so bad that in most of the Greek plays written around that time, if ever the, one of the characters was supposed to have come from Corinth, he was always depicted as being drunk. That's the sort of place it was. The Greeks had a word to Corinthianize, and to Corinthianize means that you drag someone down, you corrupt them. And here he was, he arrived in this place. Now later on, having worked there, having seen many people saved in that place, he wrote this epistle, and he reminds this church, and we're going to think about the church on another evening, we're not going to think about the church tonight but he reminds them of the way he came. And he says, now I didn't come and try and match the oratory of these Greeks. That wasn't my purpose at all. So that when I preach my message, when I preach my gospel, it was not with clever words, with clever phraseologies. It wasn't like that at all. But he says it was with demonstration of power, of the power of God and of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I believe we can learn a great deal from Paul's approach to this tremendous task which God gave him to present the Christian message to these people. He did not try to copy their methods. I sometimes feel that the church is making a great mistake today in attempting to reach the world by copying the methods and the phraseologies of the world. I believe that Christian songs are greater than anything that the world can produce. No need for us to try and copy the styles of their music. I believe that the message that we have is revolutionary. Paul went to that city with a message which was absolutely revolutionary. Here were people who were boasting in their forward-looking ways, in all the ways in which their ideas were in advance of all of everyone else's ideas. But Paul came with a message which was right at the heart and the root of all human need and problems. The Christian gospel is concerned with human need, but he gets right to the root of, of the, the basic and the greatest need of all. For the Christian gospel is a message which deals with sin and with death and which has the answer to the greatest needs of men and women. Now Paul was conscious of many problems in that city. And later on as he wrote to the church, he saw how the church had many problems in the church. 
And I've heard people say that the trouble with the Corinthian church is that they had brought the world into the church. I think that's doing the, the Corinthian church an injustice. I don't believe that's what happened at all. You've got to remember the sort of situation from which they were converted. And they needed to, to have a complete change. It wasn't just that they stopped doing some of the immoral things that they had been doing that they stopped being dishonest and that they stopped doing one or two other things, they had to think differently. Their whole attitudes had to be changed. You know this is the sort of situation that we're confronted with in the world today. Too often we, we presented the Christian gospel as though come to Christ and stop smoking, stop drinking and stop doing one or two other things and you're all right. Now that's not right. The gospel comes into a man's heart or a man's life or a woman's heart or a woman's life and the aim of God and the purpose of God is to make us new creatures in Christ Jesus. And it is in this epistle or the second epistle to the Corinthians that Paul uses these words. That if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed, by, passed away. All things are become new. And when the gospel of Christ comes in and the power of God comes into a person's life, he changes our attitudes. There were people in Corinth who were selfish, many of them. Well, the gospel of Christ aims at making people who are selfish, unselfish. There were many people in Corinth whose one aim in life was to become rich. That's why they had gone to that city. That's why they worked there. They were building up a fortune. They didn't care who they pushed down while they were building their fortune. They didn't care who they exploited as long as they themselves became rich. And suddenly they were confronted with a gospel of Jesus Christ. And as they opened their lives to Jesus Christ, they discovered that here was someone who was teaching them to be unselfish, to share what they had. The gospel of Christ is revolutionary. The gospel of Jesus Christ, presented in the power of the Holy Spirit, is the most revolutionary message that has ever been presented to this world. And yet, unfortunately, we've tended to water it down. We've tried to make it fit. We should never try and make the gospel message fit people's ideas. God makes people's ideas fit the gospel. It's the other way around. And so Paul says, now when I came to you, I did not come and the authorised version puts this with enticing words of man's wisdom. I didn't come trying to play the eloquent philosopher. I came with a simple message. Just think for a moment of how strange that message must have seemed to these very clever people in Corinth. Here they were, they were arguing about their different philosophies, discussing them with one another, and here's a man. And he has a message. And it's a message that a long way away in the city of Jerusalem, which most of the Corinthians probably despised anyway, a man had come who claimed to be the Son of God. He was nailed to a cross. He rose from the dead. And here is someone saying that through this man we can be right with God. Through this man our sins can be forgiven and through this man we can know eternal life. And to the people who rejected the message it seemed ridiculous. Foolishness or utter folly. The preaching of the cross. But others believed. And to those who believed the preaching of the cross was powerful because they discovered that it really worked. 
that when they really committed their lives to this man who had come, who had died, who had risen from the dead, something happened inside. That changed their whole outlook on life. I don't think we can ever exaggerate the claim, that the, the change that comes into a person's life when they really receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. And he compared with what the Jews wanted. The Jews were looking for a miraculous sign. And you know, if you go back, you will find that they were never satisfied when God gave them a miraculous sign. Uh, are you like that? Some people are like that today. If only God would perform a great miracle, I would believe. that God performs a great miracle, and they still don't believe. And so the Jews were brought out of the land of Egypt. And God performed a great miracle, and the Red Sea was opened, and they went across. A few weeks later, they were a bit thirsty and they were saying, God's brought us out here and he's going to kill us. He can't do any more for us. They didn't really believe. God provided with them with manna and with water right through the desert. They saw a great sign on top of the mountain, but they came to the promised land and they said, oh no, we can't go in and kill the giants because they didn't believe. The Lord Jesus Christ came. He turned water into wine. He healed the sick. He fed great crowds of people. He even raised the dead. They still didn't believe. They still kept saying, show us a sign. Show us a sign and we'll believe. And there are people like that today. They say, show us a miracle and we will believe. You point out the miracles that God works, and they say, oh no, that, that, and they try to explain them away, just as they did in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says that the, the Greeks, they're looking for wisdom, something very clever. And there are people like that today. With all their so-called superior modern knowledge come, and they say, convince me. And they trot out arguments that are hundreds of years old, thinking that they've just thought up something very clever. It's amazing how many people think that they've suddenly discovered that there's no real record in the Bible of where Cain got his wife from. And it's the newest thing on earth. I heard that when I was about 16, and it was probably very old even then. But they're looking for something clever. And they trot out all their arguments and they will not listen. They will not listen to the word of God which has the answer. And you know, the remarkable thing is this. That to the Jews who are looking for a sign, for the Greeks who are looking for wisdom, just as in this modern world, Paul had only one message. And that was the message of the cross. You see a person whose life has been corrupted by the immoral life that they've lived. And in this day and age, we find people whose lives are in ruins because of the life that they've lived, because of the drugs that they have taken, because of their addiction to alcohol, because of 101 things. And there is one answer, the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ. Jesus dying for our sin. We are confronted with a violent world. And don't let's think violence is a new thing. The first century was a very violent century. There were people in Corinth who were uh, very familiar with the sort of situation that we are familiar with that I was praying about at the beginning of this service. Afraid to go through the streets, people were attacked, they were robbed, they were often murdered. What's the answer to violence? The answer to violence lies in the cross of Jesus Christ. 
And I believe that more than ever before the, the church of God needs to declare as they have never done before and proclaim as we never proclaimed before that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins. And there is only one answer, one real answer to all the problems that confront us and that is in the cross of Jesus Christ. And so he says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, that was the message he brought to that city. And what happened? There were people who believed. There were Jews who believed. Many of the Jews refused to believe, but there were some who believed. They were ill-treated. And Lynn, when she was reading, read about one man who was taken outside the synagogue and beaten. And they, it's rather strange, really, because they couldn't get hold of the man they wanted, so they beat someone else up. Um, but that happened to some of the Jews. But some of the Jews believed. I believe there were slaves who received the message. And they found that they had a liberty which was real in spite of the fact that they themselves were slaves. And they were more free than their masters. There were some of these Greek philosophers who were saved. In fact, Paul spent 18 months, a year and a half, and then God gave him a vision that he had many more people in that city so he stayed on a little bit longer. And then after he'd gone, another man named Apollos came. And it's obvious that Peter also visited that city. And so more and more people were brought into this Christian community from all sorts of backgrounds. Some of them were rich, but not many. Just the ordinary people of Corinth were brought in as believers into this church. And although they had a lot to learn, they were alive. And I love this epistle because although it deals with a lot of problems and if you or I had gone to Corinth and tried to find a spiritual church and gone into this place we'd have been appalled. You know some people go around trying to find a spiritual church as they call it. Well just imagine going to this church in Corinth and going to their communion service one Sunday morning and this is how it's described in this epistle. You'd have gone in and uh, sat down and to your utter amazement, someone comes in and they're drunk. Now Paul says that was happening. So you go to a fresh town and you try to find a spiritual church and you sit down in the communion and the first person coming sits next to you smells uh, as though he's been drinking whiskey all night. And you think, this is a funny sort of place. Then someone comes in who looks as though they're half starved, they haven't eaten for a week. And there's chaos in the church because there are two or three people speaking at once sometimes. Would you go back? Paul saw this as a church that was alive and the problems were the result of life. Now we sometimes have problems. I don't believe that any church that is really seeking to go on with God will be free of problems. While I was preparing this, just before I came out tonight, just before tea, I was in the, our bedroom and I was looking round, and I happened to spot a doll which belongs to my wife. Now she's had it as long as I can remember and she had it a long time before I knew her. <coughs> I wouldn't say it's antique. I wouldn't dare, but it's quite old. And it's been sitting in one place or another in our bedroom for years and years. It's a very nice doll. It's black. It's a very nice doll. It's never caused us a bit of trouble. It hasn't, honestly. Not once can I remember ever being woken up in the middle of the night by that doll. And I've never lost a moment's sleep through it. Now we've had children. I could not say that never once have I been woken up in the middle of the night by one of my children. It's happened many times. I've lost some sleep thinking about and sometimes worrying about the children. But that doll, you know, 
All the years that we've had it has never grown. In fact, it, if anything, it's a bit shorter now than it used to be because its toes have uh, got broken. But it hasn't grown. It's very pretty to look at. Doesn't give us any trouble. But there's no life. No life. No growth. Just something very pretty. Quite trouble free. Is that really what we want this church to be? Pretty? Not giving us a moment's trouble. That's the sort of church you want. You will only find it in a church that's dead. Now, I don't pronounce any church as being dead. I believe that is God's prerogative, not mine. And people who try to do it make some awful mistakes. But anything that is alive, that is growing, that is going on, will have problems. Now, many of us, confronted with the sort of church that the Corinthian church was, would have written it off but Paul didn't. Because he knew that here were people whose lives had been and were being and were going to be completely transformed by the power of the gospel, by the power of the man who died and who rose from the dead and who sent his Holy Spirit. And so as we look at this epistle, we're looking at something that was written to people who were alive, who had real problems, which although they existed almost 2,000 years ago, are very relevant and very up-to-date today. And I believe that the remedy that was applied there is the only real remedy. The only answer to your problems as an individual, the only answer to the problems within the church, the only answer to the problems in Hasbury and Hale Zoin and in this country and in this world, are in the gospel of Jesus Christ, proclaimed and declared in the power of the Holy Spirit and accepted and received by men and women under the influence and direction of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we stand. And that's how I believe we're going forward in 1985. I almost forgot what year it was then. We're going forward in this new year. And I challenge you to come forward with us in a year of growth, we're expecting great things from God. And we believe he's going to work among us in a mighty way if we remain loyal to him and to his word. And he wants to work in your life as an individual by his power.